Hey, Mike, where'd you get these endless summer movie tickets from? Whoa, I love those. That's from my endless summer box set. Ooh, where'd you get that from? The link is in the show notes, baby. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Quivercast. You go left, I go right. Man, this wave is out of sight. Go on surfing. Go on surfing. Go and surfing. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Quivercast. Today, we are stoked. We have Braun Husenstam here. How you doing, Braun? I'm doing good, Mike. Thanks so much for having me, man. I'm excited to be here and talk some surf. I'm stoked. Did your dad surf? My dad did surf. A lot of surfing in Orange County. Founded Newport Surf and Sports, so through and through beach kid. Okay. Let's talk about you growing up in, in Newport, right? Yeah, I was in uh, Newport till I was seven. I uh, lived right by the river jetties on the beach. My dad was kind of this surf American dream. Started a surf company, got a house on the beach. And then from there, we moved down to Laguna. A little bit harder to surf, but still a really good surf community. Obviously, it evolved from there. Um, but surfing was just always what I was supposed to do. You know, my dad's friend surfed. My dad surfed. It was kind of like, hey, Braun, go surfing. Uh, and if you're not surfing, think about surfing because there was pictures on the walls and we were watching videos. Okay, so you guys literally lived on the beach at, at River Jetties? Yeah, 7306. It's the, uh, I think it's still the light blue one of five houses from the River Jetties there. Oh, wow. Okay. Have you been back there recently? You know, I haven't surfed the River Jetties in a long time. I've been up in LA for about 20 years. So, you know, if I see a good combo swell, I still know the River Jetties are the spot. Okay. If I've got time, you know, I'll drive down there for that. I think about that all the time. Like my dad kind of robbed me of some cool high school parties at my parents <laughs> when they decided to move because I'm sure we would have had a blast and hidden in the River Jetties down there with a couple kegs in the sand. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, as far as surfing, I mean, I, I, you know, there's not a spot I haven't surfed in Orange County and I've surfed there a thousand times. I was just going to ask you about how they changed the river. Did that mess up the break or make it just as good? You know, it's weird because the older I get, the less I want to surf in front of rivers in Southern California. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But when we were younger, you would wait for it to blow out, right? Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people in Orange County would agree, especially Newport, like that's done every iteration. It's been a right, a left, a point, a barrel, you know, and because it's whatever that river is doing. So that's why, but that kind of adds the allure of the surf spot. It does. I will say this, in my opinion, one of the best beach breaks in the world on a Santa Ana is definitely River Jetties. Combo swell, early morning, if there's like a six foot south and a two foot wind swell, and it's phenomenal, the right tide. Right on. Okay, so you started off in Newport, but then you, you were basically raised in Laguna Beach. So raised in Laguna, Laguna is a hill to the ocean. And yes. the coolest thing to do in Laguna is surf. And I'm a huge sports guy, huge sports fan. I like to compete. I played every sport. But all your friends start talking trash about, you know, who's a better surfer. And that becomes kind of the dominant thing. That's what I just wanted to do. I was actually pretty late to it. You know, there was a lot of kids better than me growing up. And that kind of fueled me. But from Laguna Beach High School, I mean, you think like everybody has this and then you realize you don't. I mean, you could see the surf down at Main Beach from the high school. So the kids, we always knew when there was waves, you know, and this is pre surf line. And, you know, the only thing at the time was you used to be able to call the lifeguard tower, but not till yes. 7 a.m. <laughs> and hear how, you know, what flag color it was. But when we were at school, we could look down there and, and see how the surf was. So that just kind of fueled it. And then from there, Laguna has this crazy dichotomy on the surf where it's a very small beach, right? It's only about like 15 to 30 feet, depending on the rain, between the stairs and the ocean. And the streets are really close, uh, kind of like Newport, you know, got 49th, 50, 51st. Laguna's got, you know, Oak Street, then Anita, then Thalia, then St. Anne's. And depending on what group you hung out with, you sat on one of those streets and they're only mm. about 50 yards apart. So as a kid, that was our babysitter. Like I would just get on my bike and ride down there. And I didn't know who was going to be there. It's pre cell phone, but you didn't know if there was going to be three friends or 30. And then you would kind of like rival the other streets, but like, you know, St. Anne's was the guys that were like five years older than us. And Anita was the guys that were like 10 years older than us. And there was so much pressure to be good when you caught a wave because Everybody was watching every day. And that really fueled the surf culture there. And not only were you competitive against your friends, but you just didn't want to embarrass yourself when a good wave came. And it was still at like, I know localism doesn't really exist, but Laguna was pretty local, specifically because the takeoffs are so small that, you know, you got five guys huddled around each other, like good, and it's a short wave, like good luck getting in there and getting a wave. 
and so you had to climb that totem pole too. So there was just a lot going on there. But from a surf perspective, I mean, wonderful town. We had, you know, Jeff Booth was top 10 in the world. So we had this kind of North star to look to. And then we just happen to have a ton of pro surfers, a ton of industry people down there, you know, from Jack Denny starting World Jungle. And then a bunch of people moved in as we got older. You know, you had Brandy Faber and and Eric John running Laguna Surf and Sport and, you know, Brandy and, and Hans Hagen, Eric Nelson, Frog, Sly Dog, all these guys were pros and semi-pros and for every age. And then even the guys my age, you know, you had John Rose, who was kind of nationally known. Mikey Todd was, you know, one of the best amateurs in the world at his age. And then you had Mike Morrissey and myself, and it was just like this just culture of surf community and pro surfers to be and everything. So from growing up there was, um, you know, it was pretty cool looking back on it. And I haven't even really talked about it like this in a long time. So it even feels special just talking about it. What were the waves like? You left a beach break to go to like these nooks and crannies. That's a good way to sum it up. The Surf and Laguna, uh, you could say nooks and crannies. You could also say it sucks. Uh, <laughs> it's not very good. And that's not the case every day. But right. I think about it all the time. Like Laguna takes a specific tide. And there's a couple places you can surf at low tide. There's a couple places that have to be high tide because it's very rocky. And yeah. I think about it now, like, you know, you watch like kook slams or something, someone's getting washed up against the rocks. Yes. You grow up surfing in Laguna, you learn about rocks. Like we would surf Thalia Street at low tide. I mean, it's literally like six inches below your fins. Like you right. break fins, break noses. It never bothered us. That's all we knew. But I think about all the days where the surf was fine, you know, glassy, maybe offshore wind, but the tide was wrong. So you couldn't surf and pre bikes. Whereas like, you know, you grow up in St. Clemente, you're surfing every day, Newport, you know, you get the wind afternoon, honey team, yep. surfing every day. Laguna is so tied and swell direction specific that when there's a big South, you know, in the summertime and like you know, yeah. Brooks and rock pile are firing, um, yep. you know, tide's gotta be right. Direction's gotta be right. And then you've got all, like you said, these nooks and crannies that on their day get pretty fun, but nothing like, once you get out of there and, you know, you discover that what a good wave looks like. Real quick, you were talking about your friends and surfing. Was your dad going out there and surfing with you too? And how was that? My dad still surfs more than I do. Even, <laughs> I mean, That's maybe rad. when I was in like height, you know, of 16 to 22, when I was surfing, you know, twice a day, I was beating him. Uh, okay. I surf now like, you know, once a week at most, just cause I'm just, I got three kids. I just don't have the time. My dad's yep. still surfing three, four times a week. So he's, uh, that's awesome. He's a, he's just a surfer through and through. What's your dad's name? Paul Houston Stam. Did your dad take you on surf trips when you were a kid? Or, like younger? He did, you know, before Surfline, the big trips we used to go on was just Mexico. So yeah. we'd, you know, pile in with a group of friends and, and just go. And, you know, we'd go down K55, K38. Sometimes we'd go even farther down to like Cuatro Casas. And you just hope there was waves, you know, so we'd go down. Right. Dad came you find waves. Like, you find waves, you know, yeah. find waves, especially as a kid. Uh, and then there's all these, you know, random spots in between. But, you know, they just grew up doing that, him and his friends. And so we would go with some of them, too. And, and it was always a blast. You know, it was kind of like just that's just what we did as a family. You know, my mom would come. My dad would come. My dad's friends, our friends, you know, we're just surfers. What about Toto Santos? I went to Toto Santos twice, never with my dad. You know, my dad was kind of, okay. I think he was the pioneer out there, but he was one of them. You know, they used to take the Newport Surf and Sports surf team out there um, way <laughs> back in the day. Well, you know, so, cool. so he was always kind of like the, the, the godfather surf travel guy. You know, he did the first trip with Flame to oh, wow. Porto, Porto Escondido. So they were like the first ones to put it in the magazines. You know, it was like new spot discovered and I'm sure somebody else would have discovered it, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been there a couple of times to think like, man, my dad camped on the beach when there was no hotels, nothing, just a tiny port, you know, and him and flame shot pictures. And we used to have those pictures all over my house. So I grew up, see my dad, you know, do bottom turns on, you know, 12 foot barrel and rights and lefts and was like, that's awesome. And then, you know, got good enough to be able to go down there and, uh, and surf it. Was there ever a time where you and your dad were kind of competitive, like pushing each other? No, never. You know, he never evolved to the shortboard. You know, he's kind of yes. like right at that age. You know, he's uh, exactly 30 years older than me. So he's 74. You know, he would ride a shortboard, but it was still like, you know, like a six, seven, you know, yeah. something bigger. But no, my dad was my biggest fan. I mean, growing up, he was cool. always encouraging me, you know, coaching me. You know, he'd be on out on the pier. You know, you hear about like little league dads and stuff, like <laughs> having a contest on the pier. He'd be yelling at me from the pier, like outside, go left. Oh, okay, you know, cool. So he was always a big fan, and he got a lot of that because he owned the surf shop, and they had you know the NSS Newport Surf and Sport team. I wasn't yep. like his first coming up, right? He had already been. Oh yeah, yeah. Pros over He's already mentored, so he had seen it all, done it all. You know, my dad's you know good friends growing up. 
when they got into the surf industry, like, you know, Bob McKnight, you know, famously sold his first pair of board shorts to my dad, you know, out of the back of his car at Newport Surf and Sport there. And it was just like kind of the height of that whole Echo Beach. You know, that was the surf shop before it was Russell's surf shop. My dad, we used to sell uh, leashes and stuff, what, and Mm -hmm. whatever Russell wouldn't carry. And then my dad found the lease on the place next door and opened up and for years wouldn't carry surfboards to not compete with Russell and then just eventually oh, wow. that. So he was just uh, always in in the mix. That's so cool. Going back to Laguna as a teenager, these guys you're around that are pretty much international names or for sure national names. How is that pushing your surfing? It pushed my surfing a ton. I mean, we would fight, argue who's better, who's sponsored, who's not compete against each other you know laguna really? has cool contests yeah like laguna has uh the brook street contest which is you know famous for being the oldest surf contest in the united states and then we do one at thalia and those were big like i remember i beat mikey todd when i was like 12 and that was oh, the yeah. biggest thing ever because you know mikey was like 10 and you know like in the magazines already yes and you know i was so stoked and then i know mikey todd's been on your show i saw that yeah. so we were so competitive. I mean, the only place that I thought maybe was as competitive was Santa Cruz where like they really were getting into each other. Always felt like the kids from Huntington and San Clemente were more like a pack. They would kind of really come down and support each other. Laguna, we just, we just tried to kill each other at all times, or at least everybody tried to kill me. And because of that, I was giving it back. I never would have got to the level I got without that. Like yeah. you need, and, and I've looked at that sense and look, we've had good surfers from Laguna, but we haven't had like a touring pro since my group. And, you know, I'm 44, Mikey's 42. Um, yeah. You know, we haven't put a kid say in the top hundred since us. And yeah. so that's kind of interesting to think because like you need that kind of culture and you can kind of look around at pockets over the years of like, you know, several surfers came up, like when the Hobgoods came up, there was a bunch of kids from there. And, you know, and then yes. because of that Kelly Slater East coast, you know, there's a bunch of kids. It almost seemed like there was never like one, right. Mm-hmm. There'd always be like one that was at the peak. And then, you know, yeah. you had several friends around them because everybody just wanted to be that person. I mean, Mikey's getting free sunglasses and shoes and in the, in the papers. And, and then John Rose, you know, two, uh, two yep. years older than me, you know, he was in Quicksilver ads and, and we were like, damn, that's cool. And so, uh, and, but then you had the guys even older than that, you know, Hans Hagen and Brandy Faber, and then Jeff Booth, even older than that. So and what, Doug us, Silva you know, too? not for me at that time, but oh, okay. they would talk about Doug and some of the other guys that were, when they were like 15 that grew up there. Yeah. It seems like you guys were really pushing each other. Were you guys traveling to contests together and everything? Is that what got yeah, you? Yeah, we would. You know, it was it was hard to travel. Obviously, a lot easier now with the internet. Um, yeah. But we would just pack in and. In surfing, you kind of have these totem poles, but everybody that's on the totem pole kind of takes care of each other, right? Top of the totem pole is kind of watching out for everybody. Like, you know, the Jack Denny might have screamed at me, but if someone else screamed at me, Jack Denny was going to go beat his ass, right? He had your back. So it was kind of the same thing when we traveled. And and it was kind of like that for all the Americans. And then as you got older, you know, you made friends with, you know, the guys from the other country. And just, and then when by the time you're 25, you're just either on your own or, you know, traveling with your best friend. But when we were, say, like 16, 17, 18, 19, you know, we were just packing in the car and going to contests or planes or rentals or wherever we were. What's your earliest memory of a contest? Did you, did you start real young? Junior high started the contest. I hated it. It was always oh, freezing you? cold in the wintertime, right? Yeah, You'd yeah, get yeah. down there. A surf would be terrible. I was terrible. I'd lose. I started entering the boogie boarding because it was easier. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would actually advance. That was a terrible seventh grade. I wish I could have those couple of months back. But then when we got to high school, like I said, I got in really late. And I was yeah. already memorizing the magazines, but I was also a huge sports fan. So like I was subscribed to you know Sports Illustrated and you know Surfing Magazine and Surfer. And so I, right. I would read all of those. Once we got to high school and like kids started driving and you could kind of get around more, you know, I remember going to like my first NSSAs, maybe when I was like 14, 15. And I was like, I knew everybody's name, all their sponsors. Oh, yeah. I wasn't competing against them. I thought those were just the coolest kids in the world. And like, I really wanted to get there. But, you know, once I started getting to that level where I felt like I could compete, there were some other smaller contests. I don't even remember like ASAPs. Um, you yeah. know, you had the USSFs, Laguna had some contests. So after kind of in like high school, you know, we had some competitions, but once I got to about junior year, I was like, I can compete. And, but freshman year, I couldn't junior year. I started, I think my first year I was awful. Second year I was 25th in California in NSSA open men's. That's um, a, that's and then I got pissed and I got, a, I got my license and I remember talking to some of the other guys and they were like, you know, I would ask them how much they surfed. 
And in my head, I was like, okay, if, if he surfs once a day, I'm going to surf twice a day. If he says okay. he surfs four hours a day, I'm going to surf five. And that's right. what I did. And for about two years, all I did was surf. I didn't party, no girlfriends. I just surfed. That's all I wanted to do. I surfed twice a day. I would drive to Oceanside and back twice to surf. Okay. And I would stay down there, eat lunch, surf in the middle of the day. And that next year, I was number two in California in wow. NSA Open Men's. And then I really started getting after it in like the Pro-Ams when I was like 18, 19. I ended up number three on the under 20 uh, juniors uh, on the U.S. team that competed, six of us, um, oh, impressive. World Junior Championships. That's awesome. So my rise was really late. Like I knew who Bobby Martinez was and he was winning 9, 10, 11. I didn't really get started till I was like 16 or 17, but I came on pretty quick at the end. Obviously, I never reached the top level, but I could beat anybody on my day. And so that was about as good as I was hoping I'd ever be. When you were pushing yourself so hard, it sounds like you were really motivated and, and pushing yourself. Honestly, like there was people that wanted it as bad as me, but nobody wanted it more than me. Um, there you, go. you know, I used to get called out in by the other pro surfers because like everybody called me this photo slut when I was like, you know, <laughs> 22, 21, 22. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, that's my job. Like, that's how I yeah. get paid. Like, why are you hating on me? I know you want to be in the magazines. I know I'm in the magazines more than you. And we can get into that in a minute, but I, I had it all figured out at least in my head. Right. But when I was like, 18, 19, 20. I just wanted to compete. Like I said, I'm a huge sports fan. I want to win. Yeah. I wasn't even motivated to win. I was motivated not to lose. Um, there you go. And I just didn't want to lose. I wanted to show up at every contest. I wanted to make my heats. I wanted the trophies. I wanted the accolades. Like I wanted to show everybody that I was better than them at surfing. And I never got there. So, you know, by the time I got to 22, 23, I was like, I'm never going to be Kelly Slater. And that kind of rounded it down. But for a while, like that's just who I was, you know, I took it like a job and I think a lot of other people took it like a fun lifestyle. And that was just never the thing for me. Like I was a professional athlete. Um, I was going to eat right, train, do what I had to, to pay the bills. And I was going to show up and, and try to beat you. And I, and I didn't give a shit. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> Did it take the fun out of it? No, not for me because I loved it. Okay. <laughs> That, that was the fun, like right? That. Like I used to go to the NSSAs. I was the only kid there on Fridays surfing the break before it started. Every time without a doubt, you know, there would be some kids from the location, but like mm -hmm. a contest in Carlsbad and I would drive down Friday after school and surf in Carlsbad where the break was and then drive home and then come back again at 6 a.m. and surf again before the contest. And that's my rise just went really fast in that space. Like I said, you know, I got, I got the most improved award the year before I got best sportsmanship. Then I got most improved. Then I never that's won rad. sportsmanship again at that point because then I wanted to win. But it was great. I mean, you got to give a lot of credit, like not only myself and I was kind of sidetracked, but like what Janice and Gaylene were doing at the NSSA, like they bred pro surfers. Um, and that yeah. was awesome. You know, if they didn't put in the time and sure, they were probably making a lot of money, but who cares? Like it led to all of us making a lot of money because they established this breeding ground for us to really compete against the best kids and then, you know, prove ourselves and want more too. You know, there's a lot of that as well. You're talking about photos. That's a whole different world than contests though. Yeah. So you kind of had to make your choice if you weren't mm -hmm. top, right? If you're on the And there's a lot of photos of you in the mags. There was a lot of photos in the media yeah. because now, I mean, these aren't exactly secret. I, I just couldn't figure out why. And, and it, it wasn't just me. There were some other guys that were really good at it. Guys in Santa Cruz were always like Omar Echeverry, Homer Hinard. Like those guys had all tricks, tips, fluorescent boards, painted matching outfits. My whole thing being down in, in Orange County was like I had access to all the photographers, and all my friends. And, and right. I, I took it like a job. I knew where to go on a South well. I knew where to go to North swell. I knew where to go on a wind swell. I knew where to go on a low variety. And I also mixed it up. And that was the thing that I think that like no one else ever really figured out is like three day swell. I would shoot with a photographer from trans world, a photographer from surfer and a photographer from surfing magazine, it's completely shame free. No, I never even, <laughs> I never even said that out loud. No one else yeah. ever even mentioned anything like that to me. Everybody else had their photographer or two. And like, yes. I had them all, I had everybody in my phone. And like, when I would go to Hawaii, they'd laugh because I text them all the same thing. And they're like, dude, we're standing next to each other on the beach. And I'm like, I know I'm coming down. I want to make sure you're all there. <laughs> so I'm a paddle out of Rocky Point. Like Smart. I want a photographer from every Jeez. magazine on the beach so I can do my thing. Oh, and by the way, I brought three outfits because I know there's a bunch of magazines <laughs> down there. And I want it to look like I was here a long time. Yeah. So like I, I just took it all like that and, and I couldn't figure out why no one else did that. I mean, literally I, I give an interview at trans world kind of towards the end before I went back to school full time. I was about 22, 23, Aaron Checkwood did it. And I just said like, 
just keep bringing up my name. Just keep telling people I'm doing a better job than you. I'm like, that is my job. I have contract. That's how I pay the bills. That's how I live. Every time I get my photo in the magazine, I get photo incentive. And by the way, my boards are fluorescent because it looks better in the photos. Like that's yeah. just what it was. Wow. You were kind of the, the lead into where the kids are today. Oh, I joke about with my friends all the time. If I would add YouTube and Instagram and all that, oh, yeah. I'd have been fucking posting selfies on the beach. Like, look at <laughs> this kid. I was shame free. That's how, I, that's how we got paid. That's how we made our money. Now that ship is long since sailed for me, but it makes a funny joke all the time. I'm always looking. I'm like, damn, that guy's got a lot of followers. Oh, those are good modeling shots. Like I could see that. Um, <laughs> if there would have been Instagram, because like that was my only outlet. And what I don't think a lot of the other pro surfers understood is that like, when, and I even said this in a couple of interviews back then, is like that photo editor has a lot of power. Who are they putting in the magazine? Because that's how we all get paid. And like, look, I got every shot I ever wanted. I got covers, I got the posters, I got the center spreads, first page, last page, big ads. I was friends with all the photo editors. Shocking, right? Why the hell yeah. wouldn't I have been? Like, that was a huge job. And I wanted to let them know. And I was always really thankful. I hope, you know, I always told them, thank yeah. you. People made fun of me when I got on the cover of Surfing Magazine. Like, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. And I didn't really know what to do. So I spent like $200 on cookies for the whole office. Like, no one, was, no one was doing that, right? And like, people were like, oh, you got them all cookies. I was like, fuck yeah, I got them all cookies. I got them all cookies. <laughs> got on the cover of surfing magazine like you know i was 20 years old i can't even buy alcohol yet to bring it in right. here for him. so you know i gotta i gotta do what i do and you know that was like a dream of mine to be on the cover of that magazine i was like every smoozing smoozing but it was like it was good for them too because like my of course and, and i was always really good with i made sure that i shot with people who could sell to my companies and one of the things that that i was always really particular of is like i wanted to be in the ads for my companies because one, like that's my ego, but two, like the photographers needed to make money too. And so yeah. if they knew that the realm or OP or Smith or globe or one of my sponsors was going to buy an ad, then they were more likely to work with me too, which means yep. I was more likely to get in the magazine. So it was just a whole cycle and one that I think I did really well. Your dad and flame going way back. Did flame give you advice? Well, flame and I would talk, I mean, every day, every swell. Okay. Um, no, was he like was. part of the family? Yes, but no, you know, him okay. and my dad were close and then they probably, you know, they would talk a lot, but my dad's not really one of those at, at, as he got older, like not really like the guy's guy to like, Hey, show up my buddy flame. Like we're going to hang and dinner, okay. beers like that kind of thing. Yeah. So they kind of drifted apart, but my, they were always really close in the fact that like, whenever they saw each other, I said, what up, you know, they still talked all the time. My dad loved surfing. So, you know, and flame loved surfing flame loved to take pictures of surfing. And so yeah. flame, he kind of came like a girlfriend in a way, whereas like flame wanted you at Creek and there was a Creek crew <laughs> and flame had yes. a gatekeeper to surfing magazine. So like, don't disrespect flame by going down to right. Orange County or going somewhere else and shooting with a surfer magazine guy when Creek was on fire. So like if you ever went to Creek and this is hilarious, like you would go to Salt Creek on the morning and because flame was there, you had the HB kids come down. You had the yep. St. Clemente kids come up. You had me from Laguna who never quite, a, even though I lived in Dana Point for two years, never pierced the Dana Point group, nor did I really want to. I mean, I like those guys, but like Rod Brewster and I and Dave Pino are like great friends, but like the rest of them are like beat it, Braun. And, but it was funny because, you know, there's only one wave and you got 20, 25 pro surfers out. But the thing that always cracked me up is then you had the Creek locals in there trying to mix it. I was like, Creek locals, get the fuck out of here. Like everyone's working. Like we're working. Nobody wants to be here. Like we're just here to surf because flame is here. So you had to go down there and like pay your dues with flame if you want to get in surfing magazine. And I knew that. So I remember there was a day and flame was like, no one showed up and you're fucking in Oceanside. I was like, I'm so sorry. I was like, I surfed Creek yesterday. It was awful. I didn't know it was going to be so good today. So he yeah. was great. I and mean, him and my dad were close. And and I think people found out that him and my dad were friends and they like thought that that helped and shit. I hope it did. You know, I hope he ran me because if I had an opportunity to help one of my friend's kids, absolutely. I would do that. And I think everybody would do the same, but you know, it wasn't because like my photos were worse, but like, yeah, if you had a personal relationship with somebody, of course you're going to want to lean that, but he was so good at his job and, and he was so impartial anyway, and he is sorely missed in the surf industry. hundred percent. Let's talk about Salt Creek Wave since you brought it up. It's only a few miles from your house. You guys are pretty yeah, close. Yeah, so growing up in Laguna, we just never went and surfed there. I never particularly liked the waves at Creek. It was just really? one when I figured out 
that you could surf it kind of on all tides. Obviously, Creek's a little bit better on a high tide, but you can surf the point on a low tide. It was just another spot to go. Plus, like Laguna, low tide, small south swell, there's just really nowhere to surf. You can go to Creek, surf the point. I mean, it's going to be a mushy left, but at least you're surfing. But yeah. in the summertime, it's packed. And, I mean, it's really like everybody down there. It's a funnel for like nine cities, right? All comes down yeah. to that one. You go all the way out to like El Toro, right? And people are coming mm-hmm. down to that only surf spot. There's nowhere north, nowhere south. You have to go all the way to San Clemente and you have to go all the way to Laguna. No one's going to Laguna. So it's almost like you've got Newport, Salt Creek, San Clemente. And so Salt Creek just packed all the time. Now, there was a while where the right's off the point, and my grandma used to live in that community, so I had a pass. I could get in and check oh, the nice. The right's off the point, there was a couple years in a row where they were phenomenal. This is probably like, ah, oh, man, 2000, 2001, got a bunch of rain. I mean, you could get real mm. barrels out there. Like, you know, it was like mini Cura. That was pretty cool. But as far as like a wave goes, it, it's just kind of whatever. On its day, it gets good for the most of the time. It's kind of like a, it either mushes out or closes out. That was kind of always my thing with Salt Creek. And gravels. Gravels will get good on its day. Gravels, you get a real barrel. Can't really get barreled in Laguna, but you can get barreled at gravels. You find yourself being one of the magazine guys for sure. There's a lot of pros, especially in that era, that didn't work with photographers that, in my opinion, are going to be lost in history and forgotten about where you, you the magazines are someone's going to hold on to these magazines for years right yeah what's interesting your picture good your look, name's going to come up a lot i look for photos of myself and we're pre google so it's like if they were if yes. they're getting lost in i'm already getting lost in history and i feel like i shot more photos than anyone outside of say like everybody wanted to shoot photos of kelly and those guys but like for my level yeah. no one took more pictures than me and i don't even have any so, you know, I try, there's a couple that like they're around the yeah, couple made Google, but yeah, you do have some in the, uh, in there, but it was just, it was just everybody trying to pay the bills realistically. And if you could make your money from the competition, then great. I, I was just trying to make money to get to the competition because I wasn't making shit in the contest. Yeah. Now, I wasn't doing nearly as good as, you know, I always plan to do. My whole trick was if I was going to a South Africa, I was bringing a photographer. If I was going to France, I was bringing a photographer. So I only went to the competitions where we could also shoot photos and I would set those whole trips up for everybody. So, and obviously never told anyone this is I would only invite people that were bigger than I was in the surf. They would always say yes. So you needed a draw, right? If I was in South Africa, I was like, Hey, you know, like here are my guys. And then when I got a little older, I just wanted to be with my friends. But when I was like 19, 20, 21 and setting those trips up, and I had it kind of figured out. I was like, yeah, the Hobgoods will be there. Do you want to come? <laughs> like that's the way I would pitch it. you know. And then I would go to the Hobgoods and be like, hey, Surfing Magazine wants to do a trip with us. Do you guys want to go? I didn't even know they wanted to go, but I knew they'd want to go if Surfing Magazine was going to go. So, so that's, smart. that's the way that, that I did it. So then I could kill two birds with one stone because I'm going to pay $2,800 to go to South Africa. You know, I want to make sure I'm maximizing that. And, you know, Durban's every time I surf Durban was a one inch right. I'm six to 200 pounds, can't surf one inch rights. And so I would get a bunch of photos at Bolito Bay and get a page and a half in the magazine and get my, you know, $2,000 back in photo incentive. Wow. You had a lot of things figured out. I think the, the world's followed you, the surf world today. Yeah, it's 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 not just surfing. I mean, there's just access. You you no longer have to work with, you know, surfing. Just like you don't have to to host this show, have to have a radio deal, right? You can no, just get yeah. on and go. So Jamie O'Brien, I think, was really the pioneer of that, you know, with his YouTube stuff. But if you look across sports, I mean, nothing I feel like could be better for surfing than how visually appealing it is. I mean, you see a good wave on Instagram. I mean, it'll run for years and be reposted and reposted and reposted yes. by all these different places. So you no longer have to have that, you know, access of going through something. Now you could just go direct to consumer. So if you do want to build a brand around your surfing, I mean, it's not just surfing. I mean, look, at, look at NIL, right? Look at, you know, some of, um, you know, the women's volleyball and basketball who have the biggest following of anybody in college because of what they do on there. So it's just a great place to be able to gain a following. And the internet gives you the feedback. The only feedback I used to get was what flame thought. Now, you know, if you do a post and it gets a thousand likes and you do a post and it gets 50 likes, do the post that gets a thousand likes more because that's what the people are telling you they want from you. But it's hard to get that thousand likes, right? It, it's hard, but you got to start from somewhere. I think the thing that the most discouraging for people is those first six months year. It's why a lot of people that blow up in, on social media, not so much now, but say like five, 10 years ago, weren't from mm-hmm. places like Hollywood or because if you're in Hollywood and you're going on auditions and they Google you and you have a thousand YouTubes up all with one view, they're not hiring you. 
but you right. can do that in Ohio and forever until it breaks. And that's what a, a lot of people did. And, and then, you know, the term is, you know, blew up overnight after eight years. So back to the Jamie O'Brien and what he's doing, but there was Ben Gravy before him. That was kind of an obscure, yeah. just totally. regular guy. And then so much. So, I mean, look, Red Bull is a marketing genius. I mean, their stuff genius. is incredible. That guy jumping out of the satellite was the still, I think the coolest video I've ever seen. Jamie in partnership with them was able to kind of be one of the first, like you said, like Ben Gravy, some of these other guys, but it's not just surfing, you know, BMX moto, um, yeah. you know, trick shots, dude, perfect, you know, things like that. People have just been wildly successful doing it on their own. Going back to surfing and, and you, you went to school. What made you change, change directions? 9-11. Okay. Yeah, I was yeah. on a day trip, Fred Patasha, Jesse Merrill Jones, Roy Powers might have been down there with us. We were okay. surfing just some funky little left in Mexico. We got back to the car, turned the news on, which people still listen to, you know, the radio, of and course. they yeah. were telling it about it. And so we freaked out, drove home because they were saying they were going to close the border and then actually drove back down to Mexico that night to pick up Donovan Frankenrider and Mikey Todd, who were also down there surfing, <laughs> who had flown in. I think they might have been in Porto, but they had only they'd flown into Tijuana and drove across or something like that. Okay. Picked them up too. And then, um, you know, what happened after that was, you know, the marketing across the United States mm. dropped, not just the surf industry, but everywhere. And so I looked at my salary and at the time I was surfing for the realm and the realm yeah. gone out of business and they owed me like nine months, uh, Ooh. worth of pay. You know, I think it was like 30 grand or something like that. Still F you guys at the realm. You still owe me 30 grand. Um, <laughs> so I had, I had nothing. That's a lot of money. And uh, I went to OP and I had gone from like, you know, I think I was making like three grand a month from that. And I think I was making about a thousand a month from my wetsuit. I dropped Excel and gone to Realm wetsuits from Japan, which I just thought was really cool because no one else had them. Yeah. OP, I think, started paying me $250 a month because that's all the marketing budget would allow. And okay. I basically was like, I am not going to just be a burned out. 35 year old surfer. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I have some yeah. great friends that are 35 year old burned out surfers, but yes. that, just, that wasn't in my cards. I wanted options. So if I wanted to be a burned out 35 year old surfer, I could be that. But if I wanted mm -hmm. to go into business, which I always really wanted to do and, and sports and some of these other places, I wanted a degree. And I didn't know if I was going to learn anything and shit. I was giving up my dreams to go back to college, but I really wanted that as part of just my life resume. So I did that. I went to junior college. I was able to keep my sponsors, built it back up. And then I went to USC for three years. Luckily, Michael Marks at OP is a very smart guy. He went to college. He was all in on me doing it. I think at the time it was so frowned upon that some other guys were going to college and not telling their sponsors because people just would like drop them. It's very weird if you think back about it. But I did everything I could to keep my sponsors while I was there. My frat had OP shirts. I would make custom shirts for the whole frat, big logos, oh, big cool. walk around. I threw parties, OP summer nights at Margaritaville and Newport Beach. And then I did it at the Blue Beat for two summers. I'd Smith posters up. I'd make decks from college for my sponsors and show them everything that I did that year. All the other stuff that I was doing, I was getting on like TV and going on auditions in LA at the time, still wearing stuff, doing everything I could to keep those sponsors. But yeah, that was, that was really the genesis of it for me. And then also I, I almost signed with Billabong and Billabong wouldn't probably, maybe they would have cut my salary, but they would have surely paid me. And I think about that all the time because had I've signed with Billabong, cause Steve Clark was from Laguna. I was doing really well at the time. Um, that was like right at my peak when I was like, you know, 21, I was on the cover of the magazines and, and all these other things. And, and Billabong was like, look, we really like the guys at the realm. We don't want to steal you from them because I was day one realm guy right after Pat O'Connell. But if you want to come with us, you can. And I was like, man, like I'm going to be your 30th guy. <laughs> like I'm never going to be yeah. Andy. Like I'm like, you know, top five on the realm. I'm in all their ads. I was like, yeah. no, nah, I'll just stick with the realm. And then I think about that all the time because I would have gone to Billabong and never would have gone to college because I, part of the reason I wanted to go is after 9-11 and that salary got cut and I had no sponsors and everything that I went in. But college was great, man. It's all my best friends, you know, for life that I you know met through there outside of surfing, gave me this whole other world. Um, and I love business and I love sports and, you know, that's what I do now. So I was able to really do that at USC because there was so much sports, so much business. So that was a really good decision for me. Personality wise, surfers versus the mainstream regular people from all around USC, you know, 
we have students all around the world. Yeah. So our frat, we used to call it West of the Five. <laughs> so it was like, uh, <laughs> okay. and, and I joined the fraternity at 23. There was a picture of me in Surfer uh, Magazine that Chris Morrow did where they put $100 bills all over me and put me in a suit leading up again. I think I remember that one. And so yeah. uh, it was the interview about the fraternity. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> so I was a 23 year old and Van Wilder had just came out. So I was fraternity, okay. kind of like president social chair at, at 25, 26. And so everybody would make fun of me, but I loved it. That was part of that juxtaposition where like, here's a surfer, you know, wearing a suit to you know USC Business School. I uh, graduated in the top ten of my class, and uh, I just loved it. I was you know I hated my teachers in high school. My teachers came to my graduation dinner with my parents after college, so it was just like you know this whole flip. But the difference, you know, the laid back style, like I missed that. I felt like you know I don't really talk as much like that anymore. But I used to you know I used to have a pretty good dude back in the day. When we were kind of west of the five kids, you know, it was kids from San Diego all the way up to Santa Cruz. So it was the same kind of language. And USC is right by the beach anyway. But our rival frat was definitely like the two collar polo kids. So, you know, we'd show up in Volcom shirts and they'd show up in polos. And we used to try to beat their ass, <laughs> whether it was girls <laughs> or fights or sport yeah. or anything. You know, that was a pretty good uh, head to head there. So I've been on both sides. I mean, look, I, I'm a huge people person. Uh, extreme extrovert. So I like it all, you know, sometimes I miss being, you know, down in Laguna and hanging with those guys and, you know, they're going to the same bars that we were going to 25 years ago. But then I also like, you know, being in, 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 in real meetings and, you know, dealing with real companies outside of, you know, that kind of laid back surf culture. Unsalted. How hard was that to film that movie? Unsalted was so cool. I, I wish I did was more it? of that. You know, I almost went to Indo a couple times. I never really got to go to the end of the earth, but that trip was so fun because, Again, Michael Marks at OP had told yep. a few of us on the OP team, they were sponsoring it. Kind of like something that you think would be so obvious now, but nobody really did then was like, hey, we'll sponsor it, but use our athletes. So we got a call in like November and was like, over the next six months, if it gets good, you're going to go. So just be ready. So I get a call at like five in the afternoon and they're like, hey, our guy in Duluth, Minnesota thinks it's going to be good. And I was like, all right. We left overnight, flew, yeah. got there at like three or four in the morning. Met some people we didn't know. It was me and Joe Kern. And okay. then we we got a ride, you know, way out there. And I remember pulling up and looking out and being like, there's no waves because there's an outer reef. And they're like, no, no, that's ice. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> you can't surf in ice. Uh, and sure enough, like the surf went from one foot to two foot to three foot to four to five, a barreling right and left, like three guys out, wave intervals at like four seconds. Oh, um, yeah. And we just... We went out, I surfed three hours, I had an absolute blast. One of the, still one of the coolest things I've ever done. And then the photo that everybody loves is the one there's icicles hanging from my head. And and yes. Red Bull had it as like one of the top fifty sports photos of all time. They did these giant eight foot yes. boxes and did all these displays. I didn't break those because I knew that was gonna be a good picture. And I just left yeah. them going and left them going. So sure enough, I got in and and that was, so that awesome. was cool. But that unsalted movie was great. I mean, they uh a lot of people saw that. I, I took a bunch of like my frat and friends from USC to see it in uh, Newport when it came out. And uh, that was so rad. really cool. You're acting and stuff. So I can't find the commercial, but I guess you did a, a, a commercial with Beckham. Yeah. You know, it, it, the, it, the Pepsi it came up the other day about a month ago. It was trending. You know, it had about like 10 million views. So I got a bunch of wow. people sent it to me. I saw there was a surf podcast that talked about it. One of my cousins sent it to me. So oh, okay. I was at a contest in France and mm -hmm. they were interviewing surfers. They were looking for doubles, which they ended up mm -hmm. getting. They needed people that looked like the pro surfers to surf in the commercial. Right. And I was like, look, I don't want to be a double. I don't know what you're doing. I'm not going to interview with you, whatever. So yeah. I surfed my heat. I came in, I won. I got like the highest score I ever got on the road. I got a, like a, I think I got a 10 and I claimed it. Okay. Like, big wave. Well, that's cool. Floater jumped off. And I came in, so I did one interview, I did another interview, and then I did another interview. And like the third interview, I was like, wait a second, <laughs> you're those guys looking for doubles. Like, you don't give a shit that I just won my heat. <laughs> and so I finished the interview, spun in a circle, whatever they wanted. Didn't think anything of it. About three months later, still like, you know, new to email, my Braun 949 at AOL, I get an email. <laughs> hey, we, uh, we want you to be in this commercial. Would you be interested? And I was like, what's the commercial? They're like, we're going to pay you $25,000 to fly to Fiji and star in this commercial for five days. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Of course I'm going to yeah. do that. 
So I remember I go to one of my professors because I had a, a midterm. I'm like, hey, I can't take the midterm. I'm, I'm going to Fiji. I got this incredible opportunity. He's like, hey, if you don't take the midterm, you got to drop the class. I'm like, I don't think you heard me. <laughs> I'm going to Fiji. <laughs> can I make this yeah. up? Okay, so I'll drop the class. So I ended up taking geology three times, once at junior college, it didn't transfer, <laughs> once here, and then I got kicked out. And then once I had to take it again. I know all about clouds and surf and everything, which I already knew. So this is pretty funny. <laughs> I go over there, get off the plane. I have no idea what to expect. I don't even know if it's a good commercial or a bad commercial. I'm just there. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're st- we go out to this island, this little circle island with this huge rock that had it all pulled out. It's like 300 people there. The director had just made the cell with Jennifer Lopez. They were like, you're up. And so I, I do my thing. And I remember a, a, a coconut fell on. I just slapped like the, um, the cooler against my hand and turn around and look and say, you know, like, what are you guys doing? And I did it. And the director's like, wait a second. You know, he's an Indian guy. He has a full accent. He's like, he, he, he can't act at all. He acts like a fucking Chucky doll. Who got me a Chucky doll? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? I was like, oh man. So he like dumbed it completely down for me. All, all of you, he's like, just turn around and look at the ocean. Like no expressions <laughs> or anything. And so that's what ends up in the commercial. The second day I went out there, I did it again or something else. And I remember he stopped and he goes, oh my God, he learned how to act. He learned how to act overnight. He's like, shoot everything today before he loses it. <laughs> I was like, I mean, this guy didn't say a word to me otherwise, but you know, it was this huge production. And so, then uh, what they ended up doing is they had uh, extras in for David Beckham, Ronaldo, Tierra and Ree, um, and they kind of played with me. And then it was us versus them. And then they shot all the surfers in Barcelona. And so you can kind of see when you watch it, when it goes to green screen and back and obviously their faces, uh, but it's pretty awesome. I, I went to a soccer game and it played in the middle of the game. And I mean, that commercials just ran ever since. And it always trends like they don't make, it's just a really good commercial. I think it won awards or something like that. But the funniest part about it to me was I came back from just drunk college kid at like 3 a.m. I had an email from them that they wanted to run it on the uh, U.S. uh, Mexico stations. And I remember thinking in my head at the time, I was like, well, they can't run it without me. And they're like, hey, I want to pay you four grand. And I, I woke up the next day and I went and got my computer and I was like, what's this email? And I was like, oh my God, I replied last night. I'm like, what did I say? And they had responded <laughs> and I had said, yeah, right, eight. And that was it. And they had responded, okay. <laughs> so oh, like, wow, yes. That was the only time I made four grand drinking. So that was, um, that was just really awesome. cool. And, you know, it was like, it, now I look back at it, it, you know, it seemed like stuff like that would always happen. And, you know, obviously it, it never did sense. I ended up, I was in seven commercials. I did one kind of similar for um, Toyota, another one for Gatorade. They took us down to Porto Escondido. So it was like that launched me into a few other things too, which was pretty cool. You do not live near the ocean anymore. What brought you to, is it Tennessee? Yep. Tennessee. I'm in Memphis. My wife is from Memphis. Okay. On like our second date, she said, you know, hey, I want to raise my kids in Memphis. Second date, I'm like, sure, yeah, whatever. <laughs> cool. Yeah. You know, whatever puts this forward. So, you know, here we are uh, seven years later. We've got three kids. She's one of 10. I've got a four-year-old and twins that are uh, two. And so we've okay. got 30 grandkids on this side. So it's just a blast being here with her whole family. And I mean, they're all amazing. And we've got 30 grandkids, which kind of throw the kids in a pile with the other kids. So I, I go back and forth um, between LA and, and here now, which is, um, it's great. It's great. You know, everybody out here, it's big sports, sports business, chilling, drinking beer. I could do that. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of a social chameleon. I can kind of fit in wherever I go. I got strong dude game, as they like to say out here. So uh, okay. it's, been a, it's been a blast to just, you know, kind of discover a, a, a new side of, uh, you know, life in the United States, which definitely is in Laguna Beach. It is definitely not Southern California. I'm guessing. I, I've never been in <laughs> no, Memphis. It's Memphis. not. It is not. It's, <laughs> Do you want to talk about your business? Yeah, I'd love to. So, uh, and and obviously as it pertains to you with the podcast stuff. So, yeah, it does. Um, five years ago, I started a, a business called Believe, B-L-E-A-V. I went full gamer tag, uh, kind of saw SEO coming big. I wanted it no matter where you were, if you just typed in that, it would find us, YouTube, Google, podcasts, whatever. Yes. And I was just looking for a spot for two of my clients that I was working with, Jay Glazer and Ryan Leaf on the sports side at an agency. And uh, I saw it coming as direct to consumer. Before that, I was a clothing company for five years, kind of saw what happened there with, you know, Instagram, you could go direct to consumer, you didn't have to sell to Nordstrom, saw the same thing coming for host, and knew from my own experience of going on, you know, hundreds of auditions in LA, uh, trying to be a host to now representing host that it was just hard, right? Local radio, local TV was hard, you couldn't just get those jobs. And there was no way to test yourself, you had to go to a smaller market. So leave LA, go to Toledo, you know, cover sports yeah. there and then maybe get back to LA one day. Um, so I Hopefully. told him, 
yeah, I told him they should get started. Uh, Ryan Leaf did. Uh, he was the first host. Uh, now we've got about 150 uh, athletes on the platform, about 800 content wow. creators. We do about 100 episodes a day. And all we tried to do was just fill the void of, if you're going to get into podcasting, uh, what do you need? How can we help? And that's just, we've taken it all the way through from there. And we're really um, topic driven. So we have 32 NFL shows. They all have a former player. It's really about taking athletes and just trying to maximize their ability to gain an audience because it's hard. You know, just because you played, you know, three years in the league doesn't mean you're going to be a wildly successful personality. Um, but it also doesn't mean that you can't try. And so mm -hmm. we kind of weigh the gap. And now after five years, it's great to say that, you know, we did fill that gap. Uh, if you are 100%. You know, in sports and you're looking to break in, you know, we are the place to go. And then now that we've evolved, now we can work with shows that already have an audience. So, you know, we'll bring in somebody that's got, you know, 100, 500,000 downloads because, you know, we can help them monetize. We can help them build. We do a lot of third-party distribution. We have 10 of our shows on other uh, stations. So, like, if you're a uh, Chargers or Rams fan, like, our show runs on Bally's uh, West. So, if you turn it on there and you see Charger Raid, like, we produce that with our talent that started as podcast, but now they're up to video that's and badass. now they're on TV. So, that's really the escalation. And it's been great. And, you know, we're just not stopping. The goal is just more. Awesome. Well, Bron, I thank you so much for coming on the Quivercast. Okay. Well, look, thank you so much for having me. It's awesome what you're doing. Uh, there's a lot of good stories in surf and hopefully I was able to present a few of them. And I, I listened to a little bit of some of the other shows and uh, I'm going to be a big fan moving forward. So thank you, Bron, for coming on the Quivercast. All right, everyone, we're out of here. Mike and Bron, later. Left. Thanks, Bron. I go later. right, man, this wave is out of sight. Going surfing, going surfing, going surfing with friends. Ride this wave to the shore. Paddle out, I'm gonna catch ten more Going surfing Going surfing Going surfing with friends I don't care if it's wrong or right I'm gonna do it all day I'm gonna do it all night I'm going surfing Going surfing Going surfing with friends Hey guys, Endless Summer Box Set. This thing is legit. It's authentic, numbered certificate in it. It has a five frame film strip from the original print. You will literally own a piece of history. It has a specially minted bronze medallion. Dude, that thing's sick. Okay, there's so much more here. Go to the show notes. There's a link on there. Go check this piece of history out. This thing's rad. Seriously. Smithsonian American History Museum has it. It took four years of research with 3.5 in production. All hand assembled. This thing's rad. So much to this awesome box set. Remastered DVD. Sharper images than the original film. But dude, this thing's so sick. Link in the show notes.